I'm amazed, grateful to God, I'm not uh, so much grateful to God for who was elected our president as I'm grateful for God to God for who was not elected our president. And I'm hopeful that perhaps the Lord has shown mercy, even if it's a severe mercy, has shown mercy. And we're looking today at uh, as we enter the, the trial phase of the life of Jesus in Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. Jesus is subjected to a mockery of justice. You know, uh, one of the hallmarks of our nation historically has been that we're a nation of laws. In recent years, those have been abandoned and trampled on. This is not the subject of the message this morning, but people have asked from time to time, well, does, does America have a king? Who's, and while some politicians may want to put themselves forward as a king, well, the answer is sort of there's no and yes. No, we don't have a king. We're not a monarchy. But a book was written years ago, a fellow named Samuel Rutherford, entitled Lex Rex. Lex being the Latin for law, Rex being the Latin for king. And the argument in the book is that, that if you're going to be a nation of laws, then, then the law is the king, and everybody must be subject to the law. And we have a constitution. We're not a democracy. We're a constitutional republic. So the constitution, in a sense, on, on paper, is our, is our king. In recent years, that has been trampled underfoot. It's been twisted and contorted where it's not even recognizable. My prayer and my hope is that we will return to being a, a nation of laws, where the Constitution is upheld, where people who swear an oath to the Constitution mean it, where, where justices that are appointed recognize that their duty is to uphold the Constitution. Where the military will return from being a, no longer being a social engineering project to a battle-ready group who will defend us from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Why do I say all that? Because we're not the first culture to experience a mockery of justice, even though we've seen it on a, on a high scale, even in recent weeks, where, where entities that are not supposed to be politicized, supposed to be beyond being politicized, the Department of Justice, the FBI, have definitely taken political positions, ignored law, ignored evidence. We're not the first. Jesus wasn't the first, but Jesus' situation, as Joshua pointed out, was unique in terms of the heinousness of it. I'm going to show you that as we look at this passage. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 14, verses 53 to 65. I'm going to read from these verses, and we'll look at some others today as we kind of set for you a chronology of the, of the kangaroo courts that Jesus was taken through. If you found that in your Bible, please stand as we prepare to read that. If you don't have your Bible, we're going to put it on the screen for you so you can follow along in the text. It's, it's critical. Remember, we do some things here in worship. We do a lot of things intentionally. One is we read responsibly every week so that out of your mouth, if you participate, out of your mouth, will come the audible sound of the Word of God. It's very critical that that happens. We make the Scripture available in many, by many means here so that you can see with your eyes, gaze upon the Word. The Word of God is what endures. Mark chapter 14, verses 53 to 65, And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. 
And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Which is to say the Son of God. And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him and say to him, Prophesy! And the guards received him with blows. It's a painful thing to read, but we've just read what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord teach us today what we need to learn from this. To embrace our Lord Jesus Christ in His passion. Learn to live as people who respect the rule of law and stand for that. And also be ready to receive the same treatment at the hands of those who because they hated him will hate his followers. Thank you. Please be seated. When you get to this portion of uh, this in the life of Jesus as recorded in, in Mark's gospel, you, you do well to pull from, from John's gospel and from Luke's gospel to piece together a, a chronology of the criminal activity perpetrated upon him in the name of justice. And so what you'll see is beginning here at verse 53 of chapter 14 all the way through to chapter 15, verse 15 of Mark and pulling in from John and from Luke, you'll see a Jewish trial, and I put the quote marks around trial, trials that had three parts. And the, the first is this, this hearing, this preliminary hearing before Annas. And secondly, the trial before the Sanhedrin, which we just read, this is led by Caiaphas in his house and then just briefly we'll just observe at the end today the morning session of the Sanhedrin recorded in Mark 15 verse 1 that that moves from the Jewish mockery to the Roman mockery where we see Jesus before Pilate in Mark 15 verses 2 to 5 and then before Herod Antipas which is We'll look over at Luke, verses 23, 6 and tw to 12. And then back before Pilate, Mark 15, 6 to 15. We won't look at the Roman phase today, but that's, that's a, just a snapshot <clears throat> of what happens and how Jesus is subjected to arguably the greatest mockery of justice ever perpetrated in history. First, let's look at this preliminary hearing before Annas. We're going to go over to John. We just, let's read this passage and just want you to see what's going on here. John chapter 18, verses 12 to 14, and then again, verses 19 to 23. <clears throat> we left off, remember, before we took a couple of weeks. Last week, we looked at the uh, persecuted church, and, and then the week before that, Reformation Sunday, but back the week before that, the arrest of Jesus. So picking up upon that, John says, So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And first they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. And it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. This Annas, if you have a Reformation study Bible that we've made available to you in different ways, shapes, and forms through the years, uh, so the notes are very helpful, as they always are, but particularly helpful at this point. They identify who Annas is. Annas, we're told in the text, is the, the father-in-law of Caiaphas. He had been the high priest and was deposed 
by the Romans. They just removed him out of the way. And so what you discover here, uh, and if you would read uh, extra biblical historical materials, Annas was still sort of operating as high priest, recognized by the Jews as high priest, and, and sort of uh, was a puppet master, if you please, to his son-in-law, Caiaphas. And so it's fascinating that he's taken first to the household, to the, to the audience of Annas. And he's even, you notice, identified as the father-in-law of the high priest. And you wonder, if you didn't know the history, you'd think, well, what, what, is it got, what are you going to the father-in-law of the high priest for? Because he was a very powerful man. Uh, and they were showing that respect to him. And... We're told about this Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the one, if you remember in John 11, we're going to look there, John 11, verses 49 to 50. You, could, you need to go read the whole passage in context. But remember, this is when, this is when Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead and, and people who, who see it, they're, they're eyewitnesses of this, standing at the tomb of Lazarus who'd been dead for three days. This, uh, this is recorded in John 11. They go back to the leaders and tell them, you won't believe what he just did. And so they, they meet and they're very distraught. And they said, we've got to stop this. If this continues, he's going to provoke an uprising. The people are going to follow him, call him Messiah. And the Romans are going to step in and, and, and end us, bring an end to us as a nation. It's at that point in the, in the narrative, verse 49, that Pilate says, I mean, Caiaphas says, you know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And, and if you go on down and read the text there, it says he, he said this. Surely he was concerned about the nation, but he really is prophesying there. He, he becomes the prophetic voice of God. The principle is it is better that one man die in the place of many. Jesus himself had said, I've come in Mark 10, 45, not to serve not to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. I'm going to die in the place of many. And so Caiaphas here unwittingly becomes the mouthpiece of the prophecies concerning Messiah. And John 18 shows us that there's such a regard for Annas that he's referenced as the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I've spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask? Ask those who've heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he said these things, one of the officers standing by struck him, struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said was wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? And this is where you begin to see the, the miscarriage of justice. You see... The Sanhedrin was not supposed to meet at night. That was against their laws. And you need, need to appreciate that these fellas, whatever else they were, they, they, they stuck pretty close to their script. Now, we've told you before, they did some fudging for their own benefit, but they, they were the upholders of the law. Their own traditions told them, you meet in the day. And then there's symbolism here. You come together and have your deliberations in broad daylight in, in, the, in the market. They were instructed to have a truly transparent administration. There's only one reason you operate at night like this, and it's to hide. And in fact, the scripture tells us about that. The, 
that they will not come to the light for their deeds are evil. Men love darkness rather than light. That's the, that's the record. That's the witness. That's the conclusion. Here they are at night. Also, their, their legal regulations taught that a person was not to be questioned until witnesses had first established a presumption of guilt. <laughs> well, that's going out the window. The witnesses can't even agree. Their case be begins to fall apart. Apparently, the commentators that, that evaluate this and examine the body of evidence say it becomes pretty clear that these witnesses had been coaxed or coerced or paid. See, folks, some things don't change, do they? Whether you're paying witnesses or paying rioters, it doesn't matter. You, they, don't, they don't operate out of good conscience. In the court of law, it becomes pretty obvious to, to people who understand jurisprudence when, when witnesses are not telling the truth. It was so bad that the Sanhedrin couldn't even, with a good conscience, act on what they were hearing from their own witnesses. And so, things are unraveling. Another thing, uh, they were not allowed to carry out a capital punishment recommendation on the eve of a Sabbath or the eve of a holiday, a feast. It would have been against their law. And another thing was that you would not strike a witness. You would not lay a hand on a witness and Jesus, we're told, was bound. He was bound over to them. So he is in, he is in, in rope bindings, shackles of some sort. And so he's struck by this officer. So you see that they're so bloodthirsty. They've gone mad in terms of their own legal standings and practices. And you can mark it down, when the law goes out the window, then whatever the cause is, is not a noble cause. So you move from this, this little preliminary hearing as recorded by John into the, into the text we read today, the, the trial before the Sanhedrin. Caiaphas' house. You, <laughs> they were not authorized to meet at a home to conduct their business. I would tell you parenthetically though, through the years, many pastor friends of mine have been undone by meetings at home at night that they were not invited to. We look at the text. We just read it. They led Jesus to the high priest. Now he's, now he's gone from Annas, from coming before Annas, to now going before Caiaphas, but not, as we said, in the day at a deliberation, but at, at Caiaphas' home at night. This, is, this has all been set up. Pretty much when Judas agreed to betray him, then everything's been set up in motion with no regard for their own operating procedures. Well established. And we're told that uh, all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. It's interesting how easy it is to get folks to all come together when, you, when there's some, something dastardly about to be done. It's hard to get folks together otherwise. I would submit to you that, that if they had called for a prayer meeting, I don't know if they could have gotten all the Sanhedrin there. But this deed was worthy of their time. Peter, we're told, had followed him at a distance. We're going to come back after we've looked through the trial issues and come back to Peter's tragic denial 
He follows at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he's sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. You'll, you'll remember, we'll, we'll look into this, where that's when he's, uh, he's questioned about his connection to Jesus. And denies him. Verse 55, Now the chief priest and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. That, for many bore false witness against him. But their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Of course, that is a complete fabrication. Jesus never said it. You can look, you can look Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Now what you do find in John's Gospel, chapter 2, the first time he cleanses the temple, as he did so at the beginning of his ministry, <clears throat> They said, why, why have you done this? What, what sign will you give us to, to validate this, this disruption you've, you've brought to pass? And he says, destroy this temple in three days. We raise him. We're talking about the temple of his body. He was, he was forecasting his death and burial and resurrection. But he never said, I will, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. He never said that. Yet that's the accusation. But verse 59 tells us that even about this, their testimony did not agree. And you get this kangaroo court effect where someone says, well, that's not exactly how he said it. Hey, I heard him say this. Well, I, still, I heard him say it. And so it all begins to unravel right in front of the, of the paragons of Jewish law who were tasked with keeping law and order in the Jewish community. And yet... It's coming apart because they themselves, the so-called keepers of the law, were the ones that were pushing the agenda. Verse 60, and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? In other words, what do you have to say about their testimony? Now, you should be familiar now that Almost every question asked by a member of the, of the Sanhedrin, whether he's a Pharisee, a Sadducee, a scribe, uh, one of the lawyers, almost every question is a, is a trap. It's not asked for sincere understanding. Jesus doesn't answer. He remains silent. And, and it, it is so, when you read that, if you know the prophets, and these men should have known the prophets, like a lamb before his shearers is silent, so he spoke not a word. We would say in our day, he would not even lend dignity to their accusations by commenting. He wouldn't dignify it. Even trying to deny them. And his silence provokes the questioner to move a little, get right down to the heart of the matter. You see, it would have been insurrection for him to say, yeah, I'd like to see this temple torn down. So the high priest asks him, are you the Christ? Remember we told you before, Christ, that's the, it's not even translated in the New Testament. It's the Greek word Christos, so it simply come, it's transliterated. It just simply comes from Christos to Christ over into English. But it is the, the word in the Greek that means the anointed or anointed one, which corresponds to the Old Testament word, the Hebrew word, Messias, which is the Messiah, the Messiah, the Christ. That's what he's asking. Are you the Messiah? Then he says, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Now, I've told you before that Jews did not speak the name Yahweh, the Orthodox Jews, except one time a year. And that's still the case today 
Because the, the divine name of God they would not speak except on the Day of Atonement. So he says, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And the, the term blessed, there's just, it's a synonym, it's a substitute. The Blessed One who is God. Are you the Christ, the Son of God? I want to say parenthetically, I've read through the years, and I've actually known people and talked with them, liberals who say, well, Jesus never claimed to be Messiah. He never claimed to be God's Son. That's something that people put on him. I don't know, I don't, this verse must not be in their Bible. He answers as plainly and straightforwardly as you can. And, and it caused a great shuddering uproar. In verse 62, Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man. That's his favorite term. We looked at that on Wednesday nights. Son of Man was his favorite term to identify himself. And it connects with Daniel and Ezekiel, Daniel's son of man, comes in the clouds of glory, the Messiah. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power, and they know what that means, and coming with the clouds of heaven. If what he has just said is not true of himself, he has committed blasphemy. What he spoke was absolutely true. And this is all that the high priest needs. It's all the Sanhedrin needs. And if you could put yourself there, have a little, have a little, uh, pathos and feel what's going on there you can you can almost get the sense that their that their attempt is fading away that they're about this whole thing's about to come undone and they will not be successful in finding a charge against him that would rise to the level of capital punishment that they can take to Pilate the Roman governor And Jesus gives it to them just as he gives himself as a ransom. I am the Christ. I am the Son of God. And when he tells him what he's going to see, it's a rebuke to him. It's almost as if to say, I know you don't believe me. But you, people like you, are going to see the infallible evidence of that. You're going to see that the one who is prophesied to come in the clouds is me. I am the Messiah. Now, when the high priest tears his garments, it is, it is an action of, of incredible, that, that he is just, he is gripped, he is overwhelmed, he is shocked, he is mortified, he is grieved. And he says to the Sanhedrin, what? Further witnesses do we need? In other words, forget that our witnesses have fallen apart completely, that they're, they're totally useless to us. We don't need any more witnesses. We don't need any more trumped up charges. Out of his own mouth, he has said, You have heard this blasphemy, this word slander. This word of, of speaking of God in a way that, that cast aspersion on God. Claiming something of God or claiming something about yourself in relation to God that, that cast aspersion on God. What is your decision? He calls 
I actually remember now their own rules of operating said you need to hear the witnesses before you even have presumption of guilt if you get to that point and think you have found one guilty you have to wait you do not you do not sentence you have to put some time some space between the finding of guilt and the commending of sentence sentencing and you don't do that on the eve of a sabbath or a feast and passover is underway and they all condemned him as deserving death i've read that and i wonder is this all as each and every one of them? Or is it all of those who were part of this plot who wanted to see it happen? The reason I ask that is we know that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were there. If all the Sanhedrin, if all the council had gathered. And so we're just left to wonder, did, did Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus go along with this and then have a real change of heart afterwards when they saw what unfolded? When they would go and ask for the body of Jesus? We don't know. I just, I just wonder about that. If they all went along and then Joseph and Nicodemus reconsidered uh, we can rejoice in the fact that even when you participate in something as heinous as this there is forgiveness with God when you repent Saul of Tarsus understood this he experienced this when he was persecuting Christians and killing Christians he was encountered on the Damascus road by the risen Lord and experienced a deep repentance over what he had done and, and forgiveness of sins in the face of his repentance and became the apostle to the Gentiles. It's a good, good news this morning that even something as heinous as this can be forgiven. It was something that would be experienced on the day of Pentecost when, when Peter is preaching with powerful intensity and says that that Jesus was delivered up before you by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. It was, it was God intended this to happen. And you, with wicked hands, put him to death. And, and, and the, it was so powerfully penetrating that in the middle of his sermon, people cried out, people who had been a part of this, people who had consented to that, people who had, had been crying, crucify, crucify, that we're going to see when we get to the, to the moments leading up to the crucifixion. They were cut to the heart and they cried out, what must we do? See, it's, it's not too late. The good news of the gospel in all this tragedy is that as long as you are breathing, as long as there is pink under the fingernail, the evidence of a pulse of life, it is not too late. You, you know people, and I know people, that the devil has convinced you have sinned away the day of grace. You, it's too late for you. Yeah, you're still breathing. Yeah, you're still living. But all you can do is plan to go to hell when you die. And that is not true. One, while one lives and breathes, can be brought to repentance of sin, confess faith in Christ, and experience the fullest and freest forgiveness that the best little person you ever knew who grew up in church and came to faith in Christ at an early age, the same forgiveness of sins. It is the, it is the glory of the gospel. And so unspoken here now, but you, you see it after his death, is there's two members of this council who may well have participated as agreeing that Jesus was deserving to be executed for the capital crime of blasphemy. Now the problem is that they don't, they're not allowed under Roman law to carry out the death penalty themselves. They have to get permission from the Romans. 
and the Romans have to carry it out. Well, chaos ensues. They've gotten what they want. He's, he's confessed to a crime greater than insurrection. He's confessed to blasphemy in their minds. And some begin to spit on him. Spitting in the face is, a, is a, an act of complete disavowal. Want nothing to do with you. You're despicable. They covered his face, began to strike him, saying, Prophesy, this will happen again. Who hit you? You're the prophets. You're supposed to be able to tell things amazing and divine. Tell us who just hit you. So now they're. Now they're just their, their miscarriage of justice has become a complete mockery at this point. All pretension of decorum has gone out the window. And the guards received him with blows, and we know from the piece of the gospel accounts together, they began to strike him with their uh, probably with the with the wooden dull end of their spears. Began to just throw uh, blows at him. His passion is intensifying. The third thing I want you to see just briefly. The third part of this so-called trial. Chapter 15, verse 1 of Mark is the early morning session of the Sanhedrin. Which simply tells us as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. So now... This has gone on during the night. We don't know if it went on all night or they, or they gathered back at dawn and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And so the next phase the, where the Romans take over. And as painful and as brutal and as disgusting as this is, what's about to happen to him? is unspeakable. These spat upon him and struck him with the, the blows of their, with their, the non-piercing end of their spears, I believe. He's about to be handed over, though, to the cruelest, most torturous system of so-called justice in existence that, in that day. They will beat him beyond recognition. The prophet anticipated this. There is no form or comeliness in him that we should desire him. In other words, if you looked upon him, you wouldn't recognize him. They will pluck out his beard with their hands. He will be a man of sorrow. And become acquainted with unspeakable grief. And he does this, boys and girls, men and women. He does this for sinners. He endures this. Consider him who endured such harsh treatment from sinners. As a part of his path through suffering to glory. Brothers and sisters, we are called upon to share that good news. That Jesus lived sinlessly, died horrifically, rose again triumphantly has ascended on high in majesty and is coming again soon. We may, time will tell, we may have re received a bit of a retreat, reprieve on Sunday. Mark my words, persecution is coming. And we need to learn to embrace the sufferings of our Savior who died and rose again for us, so that whatever the Lord brings to us in His providence, we will embrace it and 
find the grace that the early church had when they were beaten and they were mocked, that they went forth rejoicing because they've been counted worthy to suffer for the name. Meditate upon this. Our Savior is entering into time of unspeakable suffering as we study this narrative. And it only gets worse from here until that wonderful morning when the tomb is rolled away. Let's pray to you. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we bow before you today in Jesus' name. We thank you for the story, <laughs> the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And we confess that even today, 2,000 years later, it's difficult to read. It's difficult to consider, to contemplate that our blessed Savior, the one who is altogether lovely, would be so mistreated. And yet we see in this narrative that He embraced it for your glory and for our salvation. But he confessed his deity, knowing what it would cost. Oh Lord, help us as followers of Jesus to be willing to confess his lordship. Call upon sinners around us to bow the knee and confess that Jesus is Lord. And to live ourselves as those submitted to his will. To your glory and to the advance of your gospel, we ask it in Jesus' name. Let's stand together and sing. We want to.